I'm happy to introduce Douglas, Doug Wilson, to all of you. Uh, Doug is a former Stanford student, a demonstration of the value of a Stanford education right in front of you. Um, he was undergraduate here. He worked with the How They Got Game Project. I'm not even going to say how long we've known each other. Um, uh, was also a co-term here, working in uh, computer science and uh, the concentration in digital humanities. After Stanford, um, he did, he's done a bunch of things. He's a game designer. Uh, he's also on the faculty um, at Melbourne University. Uh, RMIT University. RMIT University, which stands for? Royal Institute, uh, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. He's also the co-owner of a game development studio in Europe called the Gute Fabrik, which means the good factory, um, and has won awards for one game he's going to be talking about today, uh, Johann Sebastian Joust. And um, uh, by the way, for that game, uh, he won the Innovation Award uh, at the Game Developers Conference, which is a gigantic deal, by the way. I think, you know, companies like Sony and so forth win, win awards like that. Doug walked off from Stanford and got one for himself. Uh, anyway, without further ado, I'll uh, let Doug get started yeah, and nice. talk about a tale of two jazz. This building did not exist when I went to Stanford. Funny story, I thought I was going to be a molecular biology major at Stanford. That's what I came in thinking. Um, sophomore year, um, 2003, I think it was, uh, I took Henry's History of Computer Game Design class, kind of on a lark. Um, I really enjoyed it, so I ended up joining uh, Henry's lab. Uh, made some videos for a games art exhibition that Henry and some other people were throwing at the Cantor Museum. Um, what was that called even again? Do you remember? Uh, well, uh, Future, so, anyway, I don't know. Future of storytelling. Future of, or, um, so uh, long story short, uh, ended up changing my major, or majoring in digital humanities, um, did a PhD in game design, started making my own games. Um, all of which is to say, if this talk is bad, you can blame Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, so uh, super fun to be back. Um, I, I lived in Flomo for three years, and then yeah, I was a, was a master's student in uh, computer science for two years. So I, I know the campus well. Uh, so some introduction about me, even though um, Henry said some things, I'll say a little bit more. So uh, yep, this is the company I co-own called Die Gute Fabrik, based in Copenhagen in Denmark. Um, so after I got my PhD in 2012, I decided to leave academia for the industry, so ran my own company um, with my colleagues Nils Danikin and Christopher Holmgord. Uh, we're probably, or I'm probably best known for my work on a PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4 game called Sports Friends, um, of which I was the lead producer and a co-designer. Um, in case you don't know what this is, this was a, a compendium of local multiplayer games. Uh, by a group of us New York City game developers. Uh, so uh, me, Ramiro Corbetta, Noah Sasso, and um, Bennett Foddy. Uh, one of those four games in this package uh, is a motion control game called Johann Sebastian Joust, which I'm gonna talk about um, in just a little bit. And this is probably, in the industry, what, what I'm probably best known for. Um, just as a quick aside, uh, my um, company, Die Gute Fabrik, uh, led by my, my Business partner Niels Denikin is working on an adventure game called Mutazione, um, and hopefully soon we've been quietly working on this for years, and hopefully soon I'll be able to say a little bit more. But this is not what I'm talking about today, unfortunately. Um, I, uh, as Henry mentioned, uh, at the beginning of this year, I decided to uh, go back to academia, even though I still co-run Die Gute Fabrik on the side. Uh, I live in Melbourne, Australia now, which is really, really far away, uh, kind of painfully far away. And I'm an assistant professor, or what's called a lecturer in Australia at RMIT University in, in downtown Melbourne, which is great. Uh, I'm currently working on a book, so I'm turning my old PhD dissertation and some of my industry talks. Uh, this is the working title. It kind of needs some work, so we, we, may, we may ditch that. Um, the book is uh, me reflecting on a number of physical digital games, video games, I made while living in Copenhagen between 2008 and 2012. Um, so normally when you think about motion control games, uh, physical computing, 
uh, that's normally written about uh, from an HCI perspective or an engineering perspective. And so one of the, the things I'm trying to do in this book is to think about these kinds of games from a humanities perspective. So drawing on people in art theory and political theory, performance studies, sociology, um, and a bunch of other stuff. So that's like a quick overview of what the book is about. Um, today, what I want to do is revisit an old argument I made in my dissertation years ago. Um, but I think the argument needed a little bit more work, and so I'm going to try to spin it in a whole new way today. So now, now that I've been back in the academy for a year, I've been newly thinking about these, these issues. Um, and so namely, I want to talk about this term game feel. Um, how many, I'm just curious, how many people in the audience have heard kind of understand what game feel, yeah, of course, um, Patrick there and Eric. Um, okay, so uh, this is a term uh, increasingly that we use a lot in the video games industry. So when I talk to other video games designers, um, you'll often hear us talking about game feel, uh, both when we're talking about the games we're making, but also the games we're playing. So um, this is a really interesting and messy term, and this is kind of what I want to talk about today. And if nothing else, I want to leave you with a whole bunch of really good references about game feel. So I'm, you're, I'm going to be talking about a lot, of, a lot of people, both scholars and designers, who are interested in this topic. Okay, but um, to kick this off, I want to demo, live demo, two games. Um, so hopefully I will find some volunteers for this. Uh, first game is a folk game. It is a non-digital game. Uh, and I even brought wooden spoons all the way from Australia to make sure that I could demo this game. Uh, it's called Lemon Joust. Um, and uh, the way it works is there are going to be two people. Uh, you could play with more, but I only brought two spoons. Um, I even went to Molly Stone's and, and bought some lemons yesterday. Uh, the way it works is there's each, you're each going to have uh, hold it in one of your hands, um, and you do not want to drop your lemon. Okay, easy enough. I can stand here. The problem is there's going to be someone else who's coming at you trying to hit your arm or your hand or push you to make you drop your lemon. The first person whose lemon hits the ground loses. Um, you can have two volunteers to play it up in the front. Yeah, good. Okay. The first two people who raise their hand. Oh, we'll, be sh oh, we'll be showing another game in just a second. I'll need three volunteers for that one. So you get one spoon and lemon. You get so again, the, the name of this is Lemon Joust. Can't really walk around foot flops that well. Nice. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go um, stand a little farther back. Good. Okay. That's good. I'm going to go um, three, two, one, go, and then you can do whatever. But remember, you want to be the last person standing, or at least the other person's lemon should hit the ground before yours. Okay. <laughs> three, two, one, go. <laughs> Wait, we can't use our other hand. You can use your other hand. Oh. You can kind of do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, it gets pretty real pretty fast. <laughs> yep. So winner here. Um, give you. Okay. You get the idea. Um, thank you. If we have time at the end. Maybe we can play a little bit more lemon jazz. Um, Okay, so um, I, by the way, I'm not the designer of this. Um, I'm actually not fully sure of the origins. I think this actually might be a somewhat recent um, folk game, but obviously this kind of game, don't drop the thing, probably people have been improvising that for millennia, right? Okay, second game. So this is a game I did design. Uh, first prototype I did in 2011, and it was commercially released uh, Steam, PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, and 2014 as a part of that Sports Friends compendium I told you about. Um, let's exit out to my desktop. I'm going to load up Sports Friends. OK, I need three volunteers. One, two, three. Come up. Um, we'll go with them. It's a little loud, but we'll go with it. Okay, so somewhat similar to JS Joust. Here, let's come out on this side. You're each going to get a PlayStation Move controller, which is a Sony's motion controller. You're going to first, you're each going to register. So you press any button. 
See it lights up, um, makes a sound, that means you're ready to go. Um, so try pressing a button, good, you're registered. When you register, yep. it's gonna go, the music's gonna stop, there's gonna be a countdown, and it's gonna say go. And it's similar to Lemon Joust. There's an accelerometer and a gyroscope in here. If you move this a little too fast, explosion sound, the light blows out, you're out. You wanna be the last player remaining, and be really careful, it's quite sensitive to motion. Um, of course, you wanna kinda try to get the other people out, but now, um, when the music speeds up, it means it's less sensitive to motion. So it means you can go a little bit faster, but not still fully fast. Um, so stand a little bit apart. Um, little, even a little bit more apart. Is everyone ready? Can I stop one Yeah. No, no, so, okay. And you don't need to look at the screen. <laughs> got each other out. Okay, let's, let's go again now that you have somewhat of an idea just how sensitive it is. You gotta keep, gotta keep that arm really solid. So sneak, sneak, sneak up, you can sneak up behind him when his, when his arm is exposed. You, so you jerked it when you lunge, right? Um, okay, wh one, one more. Get ready to joust. Go. Uh, I think I might have put it on a very sensitive setting, but anyway, that's the that's the idea of the game. Thank you to our volunteers. Um, thank you. Away, just leave the room. <laughs> Slowly work out the door. Uh, so the commercial version of that is up to seven players, um, but I have an installation version. I've done it up to about twenty-six, I think, with with big teams, um, all the same color. Um, and there's a lot more variations, like the options menu. There's a lot of ways to change the game, and we, we can talk about that some other time. Um, one thing to point out, I actually did not know about Lemon Joust at all when I made that game. Um, this is kind of a, and it's even a weird quirk that we both ended up coming up with the noun Joust. Um, like whoever named this Lemon Joust um, was clearly thinking similar thoughts as I did. Um, actually, this game was partly inspired uh, by a folk game I learned while living in Denmark called Lista Lanza, which means sneaky lance in, in Danish. Um, you're blindfolded, you're trying to hit the other person with the spoon, long story. Um, interest, we, we could talk about that later if you're interested. Um, but what I want to do here, and I think, I think this comparison is provocative for a, for a lot of reasons, and this is what I want to talk about today. Comparing this non-digital game, Lemon Joust, to this digital game, JS Joust. So obviously there are some key differences, right? So the form factor is a little bit different between a spoon and a move controller. Um, you know, clearly gravity, works a little differently than my algorithm for how I um, process uh, the acceleration. So for example, I can kind of slowly turn it upside down, but I couldn't do that right, with the, the spoon and the lemon. Um, maybe the biggest mechanical difference would be the computer adjudicates exactly who wins or loses. Right? So with Lemon Joust, you might both drop your lemons at a similar time, and it's up to the humans to figure out which lemon hit the ground first. And sometimes that can be a little difficult if they, if they do so at a, in kind of a close time together. But okay, those differences aside, these games are kind of similar, right? Like if I were gonna tell you how to play both games, I would roughly tell you the same thing. I would say that rod that you're holding in your hand, don't move it too fast and try to hit and kind of um, jostle the other person's rod or this thing that they're holding in their hands. Um, so like the general rules, despite these procedural differences, are similar, quite similar, even if not the exact same, right? And yet, and here's the, the, here's the big thing I wanna argue today, the lived experience of these two games is very, very different. Um, and then I'm not trying to imply that one is better or worse than the other, but that those differences between the two are really interesting. We need to look at that. Um, Okay, so comparing these games, 
Uh, this comparison raises all sorts of classic questions that have like haunted new media theory and, and game studies um, in the late 90s and, and especially last decade. So these questions of like what makes new media like new compared to old non-digital media? Or how are video games actually different from other screen-based media like film or something? These questions have like vexed um, lots and lots of scholars. One observation that's like made repeatedly in the literature, especially in the late 90s and last decade, is this idea of procedurality um, and that like new media is fundamentally procedural and or at least video games specifically and this is like one of the essential properties or something of this new uh, computer-based media form. Okay, so classic example. Um, Janet Murray in Hamlet and the Holodeck uh, tries to come up with a list of essential properties of new media. Um, and actually, she isolates procedurality as the most important element. So I'm going to read the quote. The most important element the new medium adds to our repertoire of representational power is its procedural nature, its ability to capture experience as systems of interrelated actions. Um, there's a bunch of other designers and scholars who've written similar things. Um, here's Chris Crawford, uh, a game designer and writer who talks about this under a, a different term. He, he calls it process intensity. So um, Crawford defines process intensity as the degree to which a program emphasizes processes instead of data. Um, right, like the idea here, like video games are different than say film because code like, dynamically structures the images and the text and the sound effects um, that we see and hear from the screen. Um, and actually, you can also kind of procedurally generate new content through processes as well. Now, what's interesting to me as a designer is that like, this interest in procedurality ends up normalizing certain design values. So, so listen to Crawford um, writes, process intensity provides us with a useful criterion for evaluating the value of any piece of software. Um, and he explicitly advises, right, and this is to up and coming game developers, eschew data intensive designs inspire to process intensity. Um, here, like somewhat similar, um, like echoes of this in Ian Bogost's uh, book, Persuasive Games, um, Ian coins this idea of procedural rhetoric. So um, expressing things through the game system, through the inter-related <coughs> inter, um, rules. Um, so Ian, building on Crawford's work, writes, a higher process intensity suggests that a program has greater potential for meaningful expression. Um, image is subordinate to process. Um, now, in a 2012 response to some of my earlier critiques, uh, Ian rightly sets a historical context for some of Crawford's claims about process intensity. Like, if you were a programmer in the 80s and you're like working on a game limited to only a few thousand kilobytes in size, like you might understandably be a little wary of assets, right? And like the amount of disk space that these assets um, are going to eat up. But still, like even in this decade and in recent years, you frequently hear both scholars and game designers talk about the importance, uh, like the fundamental, essential uh, centrality of rules and mechanics um, in video games. So here's uh, Brenda Romero, a, a well-known game designer, and she's writing about some of her own board games that she's designed, and she argues that both digital and non-digital games are centrally defined by this idea of rules. Um, so I'm going to read this quote from Brenda. The rules of the game are the game, the pieces, the parts, the board, the table, computer, or console, the graphics, the viewpoint, the angle of the camera. They are all there for one reason only, to allow us to play out the rules. They embody the game, they help to immerse us, but they are not the game, the rules are. Okay, so like as a aesthetic that Brenda's interested in, or like as, as a design interest that Brenda has, like fair enough, clearly this is an idea that guides her own design processes. But like as a more general theoretical lens on games, or at least video games, there's a lot to be skeptical of here, right? Um, so to kind of dig into criti this critique, I want to return back to this comparison of Lemon Joust and JS Joust. Right, for me, both as a player of this game and as the designer of this game, this game I mean Johann Sebastian Joust, um, 
right? The game is so much about the pleasure of the sound that plays and the light that comes when you press the button to register your controller. It's about like the Baroque nature of Johann Sebastian Bach's Brandenburg concertos, which play in the back, and like subverting the high art connotations of that music by slowing it down and speeding it up. Um, and you know, all of this is emphasized by the like on-screen visualization of these Baroque musicians playing in the back. Right? The game is about this like beautiful bright light of the PlayStation Move controller, like especially if you play in a dark room. This glowing mix of colored bulbs moving around is gorgeous. It's about the form factor of this controller, right? It's about all of these things. It's about this like idea of multimedia-ness is, is something that I'm really interested in as a designer and a player. Um, so those, all those audiovisual details I just mentioned, contrary to I think what Brenda argued in that passage I just read, are not just like decorative. They're integral, totally integral to the lived experience of the game. Um, and so I, I think sometimes theorists and designers um, forget or downplay the importance of this idea of multimedia-ness in games. Um, I'm far from the only person who's made this kind of critique of procedurality. Uh, Brendan Keough, who's a, a critic and a researcher, um, writes like he's writing about the game studies literature and um, he also writes that that literature often focuses too narrowly on player action um, at the risk of treating the player as disembodied. So I'm going to read this really nice quote from Brendan. Across these early texts, the values that underpin contemporary video game studies are already clear. A video game is of good quality if it offers more choice and more action for the player and, though these may be, and through these may become more interactive and more immersive. Uh, he continues, this focus on the player's ability to act, however, is often conceptually reduced to one of disembodied and exceptional intent or process. What the player chooses to do becomes the primary focus at the expense of what the player sees, hears, reads, touches, and done to them. Um, by the way, all this is from Brendan's PhD thesis, um, also done at RMIT University, and it is really, really good. Um, you can access this online, and I recommend it. Um, he's also turning it into a book, apparently, which is really exciting, um, but yep, worth, worth checking out the full dissertation. Um, but anyway, uh, riffing off of Brendan's arguments here, I want to argue that this, this like, idea of process versus data is a false binary. Um, for me, the magic of video games is precisely the moments when this distinction of process and data melts away into one coherent experience. Um, this is not just true of motion control games like JS Joust. Um, think about some of the very first video games like Asteroids that entrancing glow of the vector display. I don't know if it's like you can't convey that in a screenshot. I don't know if you've ever seen the vector display of asteroids. It's utterly enchanting. Just that specific glow of that light is incredible. And that's like, for me, that's such a fundamental part of playing asteroids. Um, and the blurry mix of code and asset is very visibly true in so-called walking simulator games, um, like here, Proteus, one of my favorites, uh, a music-oriented exploration game. Jesper Ewell, uh, in his book Half Real, argues that video games are two different things at the same time. He writes, um, video games are real in that they are made of real rules that players actually interact with. That winning or losing a game is a real event. However, when winning a game by slaying a dragon, the dragon is not a real dragon, but a fictional one. What I'm arguing here, though, by contrast, is that we view video games, uh, that, that we should view video games not as two different things, as Jesper uh, proposes, but one fundamentally new amalgam of these elements, right, where the video part of that word speaks to maybe the assets and the multimedia of these things, and the game part of that word speaks um, to code, computation, rules. Uh, also, for me, it's telling, right, that yes, we spells video games with a space, so with those two different words, right? Um, and if you're unfortunate enough to follow me on Twitter, you know that I joke about this all the time, like how I kind of insist uh, spelling video game without a space. Um, but in my view, right, both the video and the game are vestigial, right? Like video game as an amalgam is something really different um, than kind of traditional games. Um, by the way, this is all like super linguistically, linguistically confusing, right? Because we often use the word game as a shorthand for video game. So you have like game that means shorthand for video game, but that's like not the same as what we mean by game. Or anyway, it's a nightmare. You like never know what someone's talking about when they say the word game. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, Brendan makes a similar argument in his dissertation. Uh, he makes this point really nicely. He writes, rather than merely digitized, um, digitalized non-digital play, the audiovisual engagement and the playful, but not necessarily ludic, engagements the player has with video games are irreducible and neither can be given primacy over the other in any analysis that hopes to adequately understand the experience of video game play. Um, the key idea there, right, is this word irreducibility, that we can't, or at least that we shouldn't, think about code and assets as totally distinct elements. Okay, so admittedly, on the surface of things, this claim of irreducibility is like, uh, clearly kind of overstated, right? Like, like we definitely talk about codes and assets differently all the time when we're making games. Uh, for example, here's an asset sheet from JS Joust from my own game. It's a series of frames from one of many animations of this character on screen. Um, actually, we colored in procedurally in code in the game. Uh, right, you can find this .png file in an assets folder, which is a different folder than the source code folder. So like, like yeah, actually, like maybe this is wrong. They're like clearly formally two different things. Um, my colleague Noah Sasso uh, was recently pushing back on me um, on this notion of irreducibility. Um, so Noah pointed out that the existence of clones in video games, like for example, clones of a popular mobile game like Flappy Bird, demonstrates that we can and do often think about game system and assets separately uh, with real consequence, right? So at stake here is this like classic humanities controversy about whether to look at the object or the lived experience, a kind of like formalism versus phenomenology or something. But, 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 there is a third angle here too, uh, which is design process. Um, so for example, how embracing that notion of irreducibility might affect how you go about prototyping a new game. So in that sense, maybe this isn't really the question I should be asking here. Are video games irreducible? Instead, what I'm more interested in is this question. As designers, what do we gain by viewing video games as irreducible? Um, and part of what I'm saying here is that we need a better language for talking about this irreducible mix of multimedia computation. Finally, which brings us to this magic term, game feels, what I actually want to talk about um, today. Um, tellingly, this is like a notoriously difficult um, term to define. If you ever want to stump a game developer, go up to them and ask, hey, can you explain game feel to me? Um, they will have a lot of trouble. Uh, very loosely, we might say that game feel refers to the visceral sensation of playing a particular video game. Uh, it's a sensation shaped by animations, sound effects, haptic feedback, and so on. Um, game feel is very much in the details. It's the perceived heaviness of the ball in Rocket League. It's the screen shake in Nuclear Throne. It's the sound of the ball bouncing on the sand in Desert Golfing. It's the undulation of the ocean waves in Wind Waker. It is the mapping of the precise position of the analog uh, thumbstick to how the player's on-screen character accelerates or maybe doesn't accelerate, um, what we often call a dead zone on the controller's thumb thumbstick. Uh, in short, game feel is the very messy collision of player, computation, and multimedia. Uh, in more colloquial design terms, video game makers often refer to adding juice to their game, using audiovisual effects, animations, and other flourishes um, to make the feedback of their games richer. Um, so here's a classic explanation of juice, um, is in this talk by Martin Johansson and Petri Perho from um, Nordic region, Juice It or Lose It. And this is a great talk. I super highly recommend that you YouTube this. Um, in the talk, the two of them start with a very basic version of Breakout, classic old video game, and incrementally add audio visual flourishes. Um, so here's a later version, and they're, and they're iteratively going through this in the talk. So um, they're adding gravity and animations and particle effects and a trail on the ball um, and screen shake and sound effects and more and more and more. Um, in short, they show a lot of tricks for making your game look, sound, and feel juicier. Um, what's really exciting to me is the last, I would say, about five years, we've seen this new wave of indie developers that's shown a, renowned in uh, sorry, a renewed interest in game feel and juice. Um, so some other great talks and resources that I super highly recommend, especially if you're an up-and-coming game developer. Um, from Vlambeer, uh, Jan Willem Nyman's talk on the art of screen shake. He does something pretty similar um, to Martin and Petri, where he starts with a really basic game and, and improves it iteratively live on the stage. 
uh, Ite Karen's uh, talk, GDC talk on two, the history of 2D cameras in side scrollers. This talk is awesome. This like might be the best GDC talk of all time. Uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, this is like a must watch for any aspiring 2D game developer. Uh, Bennett Foddy's GDC talk on designing physics games that don't feel frustratingly floaty. Uh, Lisa Brown's talk from this year of juicing a more relaxing, less actiony game. Uh, and you know Martin Fasterholt's master's thesis, uh, in which he does a super close analysis of jump physics in 2D platformers. So he's comparing the jump physics of Mario and Limbo. Um, Martin himself works at Playdead, the people who made Limbo and inside um, Super Meat Boy. Um, so there's this new wave, uh, mostly from developers, of super detailed looks at this kind of game field, these details, audiovisual, physics-y details of video games. Now, interestingly, uh, we don't really typically hear the term game feel within tabletop games. Um, this is kind of weird because like, materiality does matter a lot with tabletop games. Um, just as one example, so I'm a serious Netrunner player, um, and so players like me aren't super satisfied with these cheap uh, cardboard tokens that come with the game, so we all shell out a ludicrous amount of money for these beautiful, nice-feeling Team Covenant acrylic tokens. But, you wouldn't really talk about the game feel of these tokens for whatever reason. Um, actually, just this past Sunday, I was throwing a frisbee with my friend out in Palo Alto, and I was reflecting on just how good it felt to chuck the disc, to see, hear, and feel it fly through the air. And yet, game feel isn't really a term I hear very often in sports. Like, it seems to be this weirdly video-specific term, at least professionally. Okay, so there's actually a, some guy wrote the book on game fields. This is from 2009. Um, Steve Swink, who's a really great designer, uh, tried to, with this book, explain what game feel was and give recommendations on how to make a better feeling game. Um, by the way, I'm about to critique this book um, and some of Steve's arguments, but um, to be fair, it's a great book um, and, and there's some really good insights, so I recommend this despite the critiques I'm about to make. Um, so again, if you're an aspiring game designer, um, Definitely check this book out. Um, okay, so Steve starts with this definition um, of game feel. Real-time control of virtual objects in a simulated space with interactions emphasized by polish. Um, and there is a lot to unpack with this definition. So for one thing, uh, this defin is, definition isn't so applicable to a game like JS Joust, where the objects aren't so virtual uh, and the space isn't so simulated. This is like happening in a real-world physical space in front of the screen. Um, in fact, Steve uses his definition of game feel to argue that only some games possess this quality that he calls game feel. So for example, and Steve goes through a bunch of examples, um, he argues that Guitar Hero, unlike say Street Fighter II, which does possess game feel, um, that Guitar Hero only has occasional real-time control and does not simulate a space and therefore does not have game feel. I think we can understand Steve's particular notion of game feel as like a capital G game, capital F feel, a particular type of a more generalized concept of game feel that I'm interested in. Um, contrary to Steve's formulation, I'd argue that game feel is an important property of all video games, even turn-based video games and other games that aren't quite as real-time. For example, let's think about menus in JRPGs such as the Sheer and the Wanderer series. So much of the player's time in this game is spent navigating their inventory menu. But menu here isn't just like dressing on the core gameplay of the RPG. Menu navigation is kind of the core navigation of Sheeran the Wonder. The game feel, so to speak, of the Sheeran menus matters a lot. And if you've ever played this game, you know how like laborious it is to organize your inventory and all these pots and it's just a nightmare. Um, criticisms aside, this game rules. This is like one of the best games of 2016, like very quietly. Uh, I think it's Vita only now. If you like roguelikes or RPGs, uh, you should be playing this game. Anyway, uh, perhaps where Steve gets himself into trouble is his distinction between polish and underlying system. Um, Steve defines polish. Uh, polish refers to any effect that artificially enhances interaction without changing the underlying simulation. Now, interestingly, Steve does end up arguing that polish and simulation are, from an experiential point of view, irreducible. So he writes, uh, he observes, for players, simulation and polish are indistinguishable. Feel can be just as strongly influenced by polish effects 
as by a collision system. So Steve like, kind of gets this irreducibility and actually ends up arguing for it. But like, even on a formal level, the boundary um, between polish and underlying simulation is extremely blurry. <laughs> um, one really good example, a recent example of this, is Ojiro Fumoto's Downwell. Um, it's one of my favorite iOS games. Um, so Downwell, as you can see in this um, animated GIF, uh, you're going down a well, you're this little guy, and you shoot bullets um, out of your boots when you jump. So you jump, and then if you press the jump button again, your bullets shoot some amount of limited ammo. Now what's interesting is um, Ojiro did this classic thing where he added a little bit of knockback when you shoot so that you really feel, it's a classic game feel thing, you do knockback on a gun so you feel the kind of the weight of how kind of powerful that bullet is. What's really interesting though is that knockback, more than just being polish, ends up having a real system effect, right? So the knockback allows him, uh, your character, to hover in the air um, a little bit so you have more air control. This ended up within the development of Downwell becoming super important and it led Ojiro to the kind of this like innovative um, heart and soul of Downwell, which is the combo system. Check out the number that I'm accruing at the top. Um, rather than touching the ground, I'm trying to jump on the enemies to accrue this jump combo number, which when I land on the ground finally gives me a combo reward. So this is a really cool example of like, you can't really here distinguish um, like that boundary between polish and like strategy or underlying system. Um, Ojiro has a great GDC talk about this from earlier this year. Um, and he talks about how the gun, gun boots knockback addresses mechanics and game feel all in one fell swoop, um, which is like kind of, he quotes Miyamoto, this classic kind of game design advice you give that like, Every, um, every idea you have should try to solve multiple problems at once. Um, so I had a similar experience designing JS Joust. So early on in the design process, I decided that JS Box Brandenburg Concertos would be like the perfect soundtrack for such a game. And this was like pretty early in the development process. Um, but interestingly, that choice of music ended up influencing back on the game system in some key ways. So for example, um, that 18th century music immediately uh, made candle a natural way of framing the move controller. So I don't know if you saw this up when they were playing, but if you shake just a bit, it starts flickering like a candle to tell you, hey, you are really close to the threshold of losing. You better slow down. Um, this is actually a com comparison to candle that we suggest explicitly in the menus of the game. Look at the right, all these characters who are playing um, are holding these candles. And it's like you can almost imagine 18th century German aristocrats playing a non-digital version of this game with actual candles, right? Um, so again, this is an example of music choice influencing what I actually ended up doing with the so-called underlying system. Um, as an aside, uh, how we theorize game feel has really serious implications for how we teach video game design. Um, I'm thinking about this a lot now that I'm back in academia and, and teaching undergrads. Um, there's a common practice in game design, um, often recommended in game design textbooks called paper prototyping. Um, so the idea behind paper prototyping is that um, it's like really hard to code up a digital game, so you do, you, you, uh, approximate it really quickly with lo-fi manual means. So, so here's um, uh, from a woman talking about how she likes to do paper prototyping. She's prototyping an iOS game with little like um, paper tokens. Um, paper prototyping certainly has major advantages and there's a reason that it, it's taught in game design curricula. Uh, but we also need to talk about the hidden risks of paper prototyping. Right, like moving around paper cards with your hands is very different than operating a touch screen or a thumbstick. It's very different than that feeling of juice or audiovisual interaction. Um, and as my Downwell and GS Joust examples showed, early integration of multimedia and juice into your video games is often critical in informing and influencing the rest of the design. Okay, returning to Steve's book, here's another definition that he proposes that I like a lot better. He writes, uh, he talks about game feel as the aesthetic sensation of control. Um, control kind of speaking to the procedurality of the game. Um, feel, right, talks, like, um, talks to how embodied the experience is. 
uh, the sensation it, uh, talks to the sensual nature of the experience. Uh, control to player mastery, aesthetic to beauty to multimedia contents. Um, so game feel is such a useful term precisely because it gives us a way of talking about all these elements together in one neat, compact term, which is really cool. Um, as an aside, I want to note that game feel as a term is part of a whole class of terms that encapsulate sensory irreducibility. Um, Sarah Pink, for example, in her visual ethnography of laundry practices in England, reflects on the idea of laundry freshness. Um, so citing some related work in the field, uh, Sarah writes, um, Elizabeth Show notes the contemporary concern that laundry should be freshened rather than disinfected, suggesting that smell and texture are also relevant. But in essence, freshness is a state of mind relating to the way one feels when one is wearing fresh clothes. And it's interesting here to me how much emotional, emotional and conceptual work the term freshness is doing, kind of like this term game feel, right? And so I was really, Sarah, um, who uh, also works at RMIT, pointed this out to me at a seminar, and I, and I found that really fascinating. Um, getting back to video games, uh, one very visible way game feel manifests itself is through gesture. Uh, so like a classic example of this in a screen-based video game would be you're playing Mario Kart or whatever racing game, and when your car is turning, you kind of instinctively lean along with your controller, even though it might not actually be a motion control game. Um, in JS Joust, my own game, uh, one of my favorite examples of this is the aristocratic bow before a round. Um, and again, this is like suggested by the courtly music. Um, another classic example here um, definitely inspired by Star Wars is the two-handed lightsaber hold, right? And that's not surprising because you have this like lightsaber-ish light at the end of this controller. Here's a photo um, of somebody doing it. Um, and this isn't only true of JS Joust. Here's another one of my um, wild installation pieces. This is a game called Edgar Rice Soiree, uh, which I co-designed with Thomas Pearl and Adam Henriksen. It has um, sound and music by David Kanega. Um, we hang 20 controllers from the ceiling. It's for four players, and you're trying to chase your color. So here this woman is trying to hold on to two red controllers at all times before she's eliminated. And you see this gesture of the reach, the dramatic, the dramatic reach for the controller. Um, and that reaching gesture isn't just a strategic move. It totally echoes dramatic scenes throughout Hollywood history. Think about the, this famous ending of the third Indiana Jones film. Uh, Bart Simon, uh, who himself writes about physical play, gesture, and Star Wars, calls this a bodying forth of imagination. And here he's uh, taking a line from Shakespeare's uh, Midsummer's uh, Night's Dream. So Bart, Bart articulates this bodying forth as when the physical body becomes irreducibly entwined with acts of imagining. Note, there's that word again, irreducible. Um, all this suggests that this relationship between game feel and gesture um, is actually bi-directional, right? The gestures we appropriate from our friends and from cultural references end up influencing and crystallizing how the game feels to us. So actually, you know, this model that I showed before of game feel might still be too formalistic even though um, I put uh, the presence of the player there. A more complete model would point out that game feel lies at the very messy intersection of code, assets, player, and also cultural context, um, of which imagination is just one of many examples. Um, also, like, look how gross this diagram has gotten, um, and yet the term game feel speaks to this whole nexus in one swoop. Um, game feel is a pretty useful term. Um, one final thing Simon argues is that multiplayer games uh, nurtures shared imagination. Um, he argues that shared fantasies are potentially richer and more sustained than individual ones. This shared imagination is one of my very favorite things about JS Joust and in um, social physical games in general. Um, so you see here again that with that kind of aristocratic bow before the beginning of the game, um, I've seen this so many times when I run this game. One player comes up with this idea, they started inspired by the music, then it spreads through the play community um, and possibly to other play communities when people play this game with their other friends. So here, um, inspired by Steffi, um, Chris and Nicholas here have also started bowing. Um, to end this talk, uh, I want to read this beautiful Lucé Giard account of the way we incorporate certain gestures into our own life practices, sometimes without even realizing it. Uh, talking about cooking here and the gestures she unwittingly, unwittingly picked up from her mother, um, Giard writes, 
As long as the recipes of your tender patients are transmitted from hand to hand and from generation to generation, a fragmentary yet tenacious memory of your life itself will live on. The sophisticated ritualization of basic gestures has thus become more dear to me than the persistence of words and texts because body techniques seem better protected from the superficiality of fashion and also a more profound and heavy, heavier material faithfulness is at play there. A way of being in the world and making it one's home. Um, so for me as a designer, um, you know, this is something to pay attention to, right? This like the contagiousness of certain gestures in play it, for me, it becomes like a signal that, okay, this game, this prototype of mine is really sticking, that something is working here. So um, this is actually really useful in a practical sense. It's like something that I look for as a motion control designer. Anyway, uh, a lot more to say. I will leave it there. I think I've already talked long enough. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to me ramble on.